Welcome to the Wald Culture Podcast, where we take you on a journey behind the copyright bricks that block access to creativity and culture. I'm Carla Nellington, and our Wald Culture guests today are both from Fight for the Future, a multifaceted organization that campaigns for internet and copyright freedoms and spearheads a number of campaigns on issues ranging from photo surveillance on Apple iPhones and video surveillance using Amazon's Ring doorbells to the copyright limitations placed on our ability to access books or listen to or create music. And joining me are Evan Greer, the director of Fight for the Future, and Leah Holland, the organization's campaigns and communications director. And a big welcome to you both. And thank you so much for having us here today. <laughs> yeah, be We're here. delighted to have you here. Let me tell um, the audience a little bit about each of you. Evan has been organizing political campaigns for more than a decade. She's also a writer, contributing regularly to publications including The Guardian, Newsweek, and Time magazine. And prior to joining Fight for the Future, she toured as a professional musician and continues to create music and organize live music events. And Leah is a social artist, writer, and community innovator in Portland, Oregon, which many will know um, after the past year or two is home to a very lively protest culture. She comes to fight for the future from a decade of organizing in the music industry and says she remains very involved in the independent events that she loves. And before we move to talk in more detail about fight for the future, I suspect your creative backgrounds very much influence why you are involved in an organization that's protesting and organizing um, against copyright control. And can you tell us, um, can each of you tell us a bit more about your personal experiences and insights and how those brought you to the to, to a campaign on this issue? And Evan, maybe you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Happy to kick us off. Um, and and I, I love this question because it is very much the story of how I came to do this work. Um, I took a bit of a roundabout path to tech policy. Uh, I dropped out of college and became a full-time touring musician for about a decade um, in kind of the mid early mid 2000s. Um, and I, um, you know, I was a singer songwriter. I was playing sort of acoustic music, but because of my age and political leanings, I sort of got lumped into the DIY punk scene. Um, and I made a living um, as a, a touring queer uh, anarchist punk singer, basically, for a decade and toured relentlessly around both North America and Europe. Um, for at the peak of that, I was doing 300 shows a year, um, you know, in bookstores wow. and coffee shops and basements and dive bars and union halls and gay bars and, um, you name it, um, you know, and, and basically living off of, you know, five to $10 donations at the door and selling CDRs that I was burning off of my laptop, um, and packaging in, mm -hmm. you know, a, a photocopied piece of paper. Um, and, you know, I was part of a collective of musicians, um, from that same generation. Um, and we were some of the first folks to start kind of actively putting up our music, um, not just allowing our music or kind of encouraging our music to be shared through platforms like Napster that were becoming very popular at the time, but we actually put all of our music online in high quality for free download. And kind of that was part of the ethos that we um, created around our work um, coming from this kind of anti-capitalist, anti-authoritarian um, perspective that, you know, sort of rejected the idea that art and culture is something that should be locked down and commodified. Um, and what we found, you know, and we actually, we, we put up a website and then very quickly got way too many downloads. So we actually hosted all of our wave files on archive.org, um, you know, long before, um, you know, kind of, uh, or, you know, in, in some of its, you know, early days, actually. So um, for me, um, you know, touring around and playing music was really what sort of taught me the power of the internet. I remember really vividly showing up on my first tour of Europe and, um, and playing a show in Prague. And it was the farthest I'd ever been from home. And there was like 300 punk kids there that knew every single word to every single one of my songs and were like screaming them along at the top of their lungs. And, you know, it became very quick, you know, just talking to a few people after the show, it was clear to me that the reason they knew my music and cared about it and came to that show and donated money and put us up for the night was that, you know, they had 
been handed this music on a CD that someone burned for them, or they had downloaded it from a file sharing uh, platform. Um, you know, none of them like bought an album from, cause I didn't have a record label or anything like that. I was a very DIY marginalized musician who never would have had an audience, you know, somewhere thousands of miles from home without this technology that enabled people to share culture in the way that they did. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, I, you know, that, that, that power, um, for the internet to lift up, particularly the voices of marginalized artists and artists that have been historically, um, ignored or exploited by the mainstream music industry or, uh, other forms of kind of creative industries, um, is really why I care about it. I think it's this liberatory, this technology that has this enormous mm -hmm. potential for liberation, um, and to make sure that the voices that my kid grows up hearing are going to be significantly more diverse and, um, coming from a significantly broader range of perspectives than the voices that I grew up hearing. Um, and I think that that's a good thing and something to keep fighting for. Um, and so after I maxed out a few credit cards and needed a quote unquote real job, um, trying to make a living as a transgender punk musician with a kid living in Boston, um, I stumbled upon Fight for the Future. Um, and, you know, I care about such a wide range of issues. I, in the past, you know, I helped found a climate justice organization. I've done a lot of work in the LGBTQ community around prison justice issues. Um, and it would be hard for me to pick just one of those things to work on every day, but fighting for the underlying technology, um, that enables social movements, um, to build power. That is one of the most important tools that we've ever had for holding powerful people and institutions to account. Um, that feels like something I can get out of bed every single day and do because it sort of raises all the boats, um, and, uh, is kind of about fighting for these fundamental, um, you know, tools that every social movement that I care about is going to need to succeed. And so that's kind of why I care about tech policy, why I care about copyright. Um, it all sort of started at that punk show in Prague. <laughs> Very good. A good place for it to start. Leah, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and how you got into Fight for the Future? Yeah, absolutely. So I started off uh, as a 13-year-old kid with a note, two drafts of a handwritten notebook of a story about dragons. And, uh, and, <laughs> and from there, got into um, event, event production because that was how I uh, became able to organize in my own community and connect with other creative people within the strictures of being in high school and not really identifying with my peers so much and being interested in weird things like writing books or going to music festivals or what have you. Uh, and so I uh, kind of came up in a very alternative scene in the, you know, the, they say they're the anarchist capital of the United States, Eugene, Oregon, <laughs> and, uh, and ended up attending university there for a couple of years with an eye towards wanting to do writing and, and, and pursuing a, a, you know, an English degree. <laughs> and, uh, right around the second, my second year in university, the financial crisis hit in 2008. And, um, my, my family really suffered from that. And I was forced into a reckoning to a large extent with what I was doing, uh, how much money I could make doing it and, uh, and, you know, and going into debt, whereas I wouldn't have had to, if the financial crisis hadn't happened in order to pursue this dream of being a writer, uh, instead of writing and continuing with my education, I ultimately dropped out just like Evan. And I ended up on a tour bus uh, doing support work, management work and event production for an artist who is writing to a large extent that same underground wave of the uh, of the internet um, that Evan was talking about where, you know, you're off, you're putting your music up for free online or you're advertising your shows all around the country and people are finding it because it's, it's an underground movement as opposed to you having backing from a big major record label. And that kicked off really a decade for me of supporting other creative people, whether they were creative because they were making events or whether they were creative because they were musicians. And I had to, um, very often, one of the discussions that I would have with my my music clients was around contracts and around giving away their their rights to their music in exchange for sometimes 
a fair amount of money and sometimes not really that much money at all. It was just kind of what was, what was done in that industry. And then also on the flip side, picking up clients who had given away all of their rights to their music and had labels that weren't promoting it, that were just sitting on it. And that ultimately like this choice was very harmful for them. So even as I was seeing musicians being able to make more and more money from live shows and that being a really exciting and like more sustainable career for a lot of the people that I was working with. I was also seeing this, this underbelly of like the, the consolidation of the music industry back into these, you know, major streaming platforms into iTunes, into the idea of not really owning the music that artists make anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, uh, COVID hit and I got to see the, 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 the compounding of artists being relying, reliant on live shows for income because their music doesn't give them money anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that music isn't making money. And then on top of that streaming platforms, uh, censoring artists who make derivative works or sometimes who are just who have copyrighted music and didn't, you know, go through the right rigmarole to play it. And so that is the thread of my music industry <laughs> experience that brought me to this moment and this orientation with Fight for the Future and why I'm so excited to be working on issues of copyright because they are issues of the creators who I have known, loved and supported for, um, you know, almost my entire career. Uh, and then as a writer simultaneously with that, like my story there could have ended when I was told, uh, or when I had to reckon with the fact that writers don't make money. And um, since then, <laughs> while still recognizing that the vast majority of writers don't make money, uh, I also recognize that that's where my heart is. And so I write creatively. I wake up at five in the morning every day. And before I go do the activism work with Fight, I do the creative work um, just you know, here in this, this exact same spot. And uh, hope someday to be published, even though that is becoming a more and more fraught thing to even want, especially with my orientation to how the public publishing industry now works. So uh, in all of that mix, Evan and I connected over the great stuff that Fight for the Future was doing several years ago. And, uh, and, and more and more, I saw that the most the way that I could be most effective and like this unique skill set and orientation had prepared me to do more activism stuff. Mm -hmm. And in this moment in which the world is so borked, like <laughs> so deeply, so, so many things are so deeply wrong right now. Uh, I don't think that I could be doing events or music with the same passion as a full-time thing at this point. So um, I'm here to a large extent because this is, this is the sort of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and my independent event clients, which most of which aren't ha are still don't haven't had an event in two years, but are still people I talk to and things that I dream about being a part of are more the, the excitement and the rejuvenation and the reminder of what we're fighting for which yeah. is also incredibly exciting. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's been a, a long, wild trip. Okay. So then where did fight for the future come from and who created it and, um, and when, and, um, and we'll get into more of why in, in a minute, but tell it, tell me a bit about fight for the future. Yeah. So I can take this one. Um, so Fight for the Future was founded in 2012 in the lead up to oh. the big fight over SOPA PIPA. Um, and I wasn't actually around then. Um, I joined the organization a year after the SOPA strike. Um, but Tiffany Chang and Holmes Wilson were the co-founders. They live down the street from me in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and, um, hmm. they, you know, they had always been fascinated by, um, online culture and the ways that the internet was transforming culture. They were also artists, musicians, kind of party planners, um, involved in all kinds of different things. Um, and so they helped build a lot of the tech, 
um, and messaging behind the SOPA strike. They worked closely with um, folks like Aaron Schwartz and others who um, helped organize the, the largest online protest in human history when millions of people drove phone calls to Congress in a single day and took a piece of legislation that was considered sure to pass uh, and framed as an anti-piracy measure, rebranded it uh, and helped people understand that, in fact, this was a piece of Internet censorship legislation um, and effectively turned it into arguably the most unpopular piece of legislation in modern history. Um, it, you know, congressional staffers to this day tell me that, you know, their bosses say to them, don't do anything that's going to get us in trouble with those crazy Internet kids. Um, and, you know, <laughs> so that, you know, SOPA strike obviously had a huge and lasting impact. Um, but, you know, we've actually grown quite a bit as an org since then. We started out as, you know, a handful of friends, basically with a small grant from the Media Democracy Fund. We're now an organization of about 11 people. Uh, we work at on a wide range of issues far beyond copyright. Um, but really, our core mission is about mm -hmm. fighting for a future where technology is predominantly a force for empowerment and liberation rather than a force for tyranny and greed. Um, so we believe, you know, we're, we kind of see ourselves as like, you know, we still believe in the internet. We still think that the internet as a whole and networked technology is something that has enormous potential for good. Um, and to address, mm -hmm. um, you know, long running uh, injustices and power imbalances in our society. Um, but we're also not naive. You know, we're, we're not in the camp of the internet's fine. Uh, you know, hands off, leave it alone. We believe in fighting for policies, um, and fighting for a better internet, fighting for an internet that's not built on uh, a model of surveillance capitalism, for example, that is uh, based on openness, that's based on, uh, you know, communities, uh, online communities being empowered, um, rather than the kind of top down centralized model that has uh, kind of started to dominate the internet over the last half decade or so. Um, so we really see ourselves as fighting at that intersection uh, and working on a wide range of issues, but with that goal of a future where our kids can grow up uh, in a world with basic human rights, um, thanks to the internet rather than in spite of it. Can you just maybe briefly touch on some of the other issues that you go into? Because we'll come back and focus on copyright since that's world culture's um, um, focus as well. And, and you've got a, a, a major campaign around that issue. But, but touch on some of the other things that you've, that you, that you have done and that you are doing maybe. You want to jump in on that, Leah, or do you want me to? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so one of our biggest campaigns right now and something that we've been recognized for both within the entertainment industry and much more broadly is the campaign to ban facial recognition, which is a technology that analyzes, stores, and often sells the data about your face uh, gathered from photo or video cameras, matching it with your identity and tracking you potentially all around the world. Um, and we maintain a website with a scorecard of what major retailers are using it. We pass bans in cities all around the country, including you know my, my town of Portland, Oregon, and Boston, San Francisco, et cetera, um, and have essentially made the concept of facial recognition so toxic that many of the companies that produce it now try to call it something else and deny that what they're making is facial recognition and that congress has introduced a bill to ban law enforcement from using it as all at all we also work on issues of uh surveillance more generally whether it be amazon ring cameras uh support for amazon workers who are being surveilled with impossible uh, quotas and limitations on when they're allowed to go to the bathroom, et cetera, that are just extremely you know, harmful and exploitative and, and perpetuating a system that, that kind of is using digital technology against people's humanity and in very, very scary ways. We <laughs> what else up and gosh, there's so, there's like oh, so many, there's so like, many. Yeah, there, there, I, I mean, know. I think and when it, Sorry, oh, go sure. Ahead, yeah. I, yeah. There is so many. You're right, Leah. And, and part of that is just that everything is a tech policy issue now. 
right? Um, you know, every, <laughs> you know, even point. the, you know, the hor the horrific and unconstitutional abortion ban law that just passed in Texas, um, raises implications for things like online content moderation, um, and section 230, right? So, you know, we're sort of drinking from the fire hose all the time, recognizing that, um, almost every issue is becoming a tech policy issue in a lot of ways. And we need to, you know, kind of ruthlessly prioritize. But I would say that that is the other broad category is, you know, and our copyright work sort of fits into this bucket. But, you know, we continue to believe in and fight for um, online freedom of expression. And we believe that that requires both fighting to preserve kind of those more traditional um concepts of freedom of speech um, in terms of pushing back against, um, you know, less than transparent or overzealous uh, moderation as the only solution to things like online harassment, um, but also means finding real solutions to those things. Because when people are being harassed for speaking out, um, that has an impact on their ability to freely express themselves as well. So we see ourselves as being in the space, um, kind of trying to be a voice that's always pushing for uh, 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 cautioning against policies that could actually backfire and silence the voices, particularly of marginalized people and communities, um, while also being in the room and saying, well, what can we do to address some of the real harms that we're seeing from things like algorithmic discrimination or algorithmic uh, amplification and suppression that's maximized for engagement rather than maximized for uh, you know, community safety, for example. So I think um, those are ways that we can engage and, you know, we fight for things like strong federal data privacy legislation. We're involved in all the antitrust conversations. Um, so, you know, but we try to be a person in the room that is um, fighting for thoughtful policy that's not just about slogans or saying, you know, let's beat up on big tech companies just because we don't like them. Mm -hmm. um, we say, okay, sure, beat up on them all you want. But the question in the end is, what are the policies that are actually going to achieve the results that we want? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we sit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on things like Section 230. And I think with copyright as well, we fully understand um, the need for artists and creators to be fairly compensated for their labor. Heck, you know, both of us have worked in that sphere and experienced it ourselves. Um, but we reject the notion that the only way to do that or accomplish that is by having massive and automated internet censorship, for example. And so, you know, we fight for, you know, figuring out, well, what can we do instead? Um, and, uh, and trying to understand where people are coming from um, while pushing for more thoughtful um, policy to address those issues. And I, I should mention that your website is fightforthefuture.org, so people can go there and see the, the the wide range of campaigns and get involved as well. You go more specifically into the copyright issue on on what I assume is a sister website, um, which is ncreativemonopolies.com. And I just wondered, what's the relationship with Fight for the Future? Is that where you primarily focus on explaining the issue to an audience? Yeah, absolutely. Part of what we do for most of our major campaigns is create websites that are dedicated to that issue. We're one of the only orgs in our space that have a, a designer on staff and devs on staff. So we really aim to build products representation uh for uh for each of these causes that is that is a you know a story unto itself and that portrays in a really compelling way what's going on and how people so a dedicated to, website for yeah. each of these specific campaigns and specific issues then yeah totally and creative monopolies is one of the websites that we've built around right. copyright recently Okay. Okay. And on the site, you argue that current U.S. Co the the U.S. copyright system is broken, and you state that laws for creative works like books, songs, and movies make big corporations like Disney, News Corp, Spotify, and Amazon richer at the expense of artists. And can you talk a bit about how do they do this? And a related question: um, Why do you call them copyright monopolies? I don't know who, Evan or Leah, yeah. either one. Leah, get, go ahead. First. Yeah. So the, so we call them con, um, content monopolies because the monopoly is the, is the way in which our monopolistic action is the way in which they are able to extract so much wealth from artists and continue to perpetuate the myth, myth that artists must starve in order to make great art. So these systems, whether it be you know, D 
Disney or, or Amazon or Spotify all are intent on and have used the deep flaws in how we maintain competition in this country, especially online, uh, to corner the market on distributing you know, music, books, creative works, what have you, to everyday people, to, to, to fans of those works. And in doing so, they're motivated not by the interests of artists, because they think that if there is no, like, if, if these entities were motivated by the interests of artists, they would never say to themselves, having no competition means that I will all, that, that, that artists have choice or that artists have alternatives when I abuse them or what, or what have you. These companies are motivated by the interests of their shareholders. And with the idea that the more money that they can extract from creative works to put in the pockets of their shareholders, the more successful they are. And in that model, they're never going to act in the interests of artists, except when the interests of artists align with the interests of maximum extraction for shareholders. And that is a system in which artists will always be squeezed for every penny, penny by these entities because uh, really how the artists are compensated is doesn't matter uh, until there are, there's a change in the law or a mass uprising of popular resistance that, sh that, that, that makes it matter and that, and that changes how the system works. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, a central point that you make is that copyright laws that were created for an analog world just don't work in a digital world. And could you, um, dive into that a bit more as well, because I think that's a really critical point. Sure. I mean, I can touch on this just a little bit. And I would say that, you know, copyright generally, um, and and especially, you know, even, even before when we were in a more analog world, is sort of based on creating false scarcity, right? It's about um, making it harder for more people to have something to increase the value of that thing. Um, now when, you know, with analog, that was about preventing people from, you know, burning CDs, copying tapes, um, things like that. You know, the, the FBI warning you see at the beginning, you know, when you press play on a VHS tape, um, is probably most people's like most, you know, kind of, uh, you know, how they ex see or experience copyright. And it's kind of telling, right? That like, you know, you're hit with this, like the government will come after you if you share this is actually most people's uh, experience with copyright. Um, and so when you enter a digital world, that sense of copyright as an enforcer of false scarcity just, you know, exponentially grows, right? Because you now have something where, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, an MP3 can be copied and shared infinite times, essentially, um, without really any cost. And so the only thing that's sort of enforcing that false scarcity is copyright. And that is framed as a benefit to the person that created that song or photograph or image. Mm -hmm. um, but what we see over and over again is that, as Leah said, really who benefits are the kind of middlemen or corporations that are profiting um, and who's harmed by the sharing of culture is those same corporations, right? Individual artists um, who are building a fan base are often, often actually benefit from people sharing their songs or music and building a larger fan base. Um, it's the companies that are trying to extract maximum profit from that creative work who are harmed by, you know, quote unquote, piracy. Um, and I think a great example of that is Spotify, right? And there's been a huge organizing among independent musicians demanding better pay from Spotify. And what you see from organizations like the RIAA um, or kind of record industry lobbyists is they say, no, this isn't really a problem with Spotify. This is a problem with copyright. And if we just had more copyright enforcement, like, you know, Spotify would pay more. And that doesn't make any sense because, in fact, what makes Spotify effectively a monopoly is that in order to get into the game of streaming music, you have to be a gigantic venture backed company um, because you need to be able to cut a deal with EMI or whoever so that people can stream the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Beyonce. Um, and when you pay your $9.99 or whatever it is monthly Spotify fee, that doesn't go to the artists that you listen to. A huge chunk of it goes to big record labels, big content companies, um, 
to kind of continue their operations so that people can stream music, some of which is from musicians who are dead and who aren't benefiting from that stream at all. It's just going into the pocket of some record executive. Um, and so I think that's an example of where if we had a copyright system that was geared more toward individual creators rather than big content holders, then you could have a system where it's there's a much lower barrier of entry to create something like a competitor to Spotify, um, where it's easy for artists to allow their music to be streamed and to be paid um, or have people donate um, or have different ways to compensate artists for their creativity rather than a model that's basically a where copyright is making um, Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon effectively monopolies or close to monopolies where it's very, very difficult to get in there and compete with them unless you have, a, you know, infinity money to cut those deals with big record labels so that people can stream, um, you know, giant pop artists. You, I think you make that very interesting a point about the, mu the um, music industry that uh, about, and you note this on the website as well about how extended copyright terms discourage innovation by supercharging the profit profitability of back catalogs from deceased and wealthy musicians at the expense of new artists. And can you maybe go into that a, a, a little bit more? Because it's. I, it's easy to understand how they're how they're monetizing these back catalogs. What's the relationship then, more specifically, to to newer artists, and um, and why is this done at their expense? Yeah, the question is there to a large extent where the where the investment goes in developing or creating new artists, because record labels will say, well, you know, we do A and R, we build up the next great thing, or what have you, but unfortunately, because their motive, motive has to be entirely profit based and the, the analytics of streaming show that people like to listen to the, the oldies more than they like to listen to new artists, uh, the back catalogs have essentially become more and more profitable. So more and more interest and focus from the entire industry and also from investors is going towards buying up these catalogs with less focus on new um, often living artists. And also simultaneously, there is a, uh, a, a just a, a, a deep, deep, just deep devaluation in the, the impetus to create new art or to create art that is significantly different from what is already doing well. And that suppression of, of, of creativity based on, you know, the, 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 anal the analytics that old, old stuff makes more money is really harmful to society and culture at large, not just creatives themselves. There's an interesting point there too, I think about, you know, you talk about the creative monopolies and, and you know, once they have those deep venture pockets or, or their established companies that have a lot of money, they can control this area. But it also makes me think the internet creates an interesting environment or a worrisome environment. Interesting is a bit of a bland way of describing it, where you can have startups that are publicly seen as being feisty, small companies like Spotify once would have been that exploit the internet as a easy communication device and an easy way of accessing streams and that um, new artists can come onto these platforms and easily go onto the platforms and make their music available. So that you know, from the public's point of view, we often see, we don't understand these relationships. We see the companies as creating opportunities, not as closing them down or creating the opportunities, but at the expense of artists who really make no money and have no other place to go. It seems a, 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 a quite grim setup and, a, and hard to rest that story of the feisty um, independent startup back from the public narrative. And that, that seems to be one of the things that you're trying to focus on is that these, the, the internet doesn't just enable in a positive way, it enables in a very negative way for the creative person. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we're both, we're ready, we're ready. Yeah. you both have plenty to say on this one. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say that the, 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 the internet 
it is a vehicle for the existing Ill social ills of our society and the existing cultural and economic ills of our society. So that sort of exploitation that we're, we're, we're talking about and that, that, that choke point essentially that is created by these big moneyed interests between creators and their fans that want to support them isn't some, isn't something that just magically happened with Spotify. It's always been that way. And back in the day when record labels were, writing absolutely obscene contracts for 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 musicians they they were still doing that exact same thing while being like the cool record label and the <laughs> recording industry mogul and 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 you know whatever else there's always been this veneer from the middle from the middlemen um of 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 being cool being outsider etc um that that you know they 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 to a large extent take the the power of the artist and they cloak themselves in it mm -hmm. and we're seeing more and more and i'm really excited about this the artists actually being able to have a platform uh for the first time to speak directly on these issues to you know to their fans and to the cult and, and 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 to the harms of that culture and to say hey actually like this isn't representing me this isn't serving me this is actually hurting me and i want alternatives and there's been an incredible amount of investment billions of dollars into this narrative that like these middlemen are defending the interests of artists and that this is that this is what's best and they're creating you know this mm -hmm. this 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 disruptor of Spotify is is coming in to make it easy for artists to reach to reach their fans or what have you, and all of that is marketing that we're seeing more and more artists no longer buy into themselves. Uh, it it used to be and is now to a certain extent still really difficult to talk to creative people, especially those who make their living from creating about the issues of copyright mm -hmm. and about the issues of, you know, like the, the harms that are being perpetuated against them by the people that they are also relying on for their livings. And, uh, and there's a, there's a movement on the internet to normalize talking about these harms and, and to, to collectively stick out our, you know, stick out our necks and and demand better uh because this is also an industry that is uh full of <laughs> an, an impetus towards ret retribution or cancellation or attacking those who speak out against the moneyed interests and um i think it's really ex it, it, it's exciting for me to see uh this moment feel different than a lot of what I've seen in the past in terms of the rabble rousing around copyrights, because we have a new uh, orientation as a culture to uh, to monopoly and to what the harms of monopoly can be with disinformation, with the, everything from disinformation to the Mercers. Like we've got a lot of examples here about um, how this concentration of power is harmful. And I don't think that it's necessarily surprising to people Although they are shocked by it to see that this is happening in the creative industries too. I don't know, Evan, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, just really quickly, a couple of things. I mean, I think first, the first thing is that I think the root of a lot of that harm is centralization, right? You know, when the internet was a less centralized place and you could go listen to a band, a few of their songs on MySpace, and then maybe you'd go to their website and like, that's kind of where you'd find out, you know, the rest of their music or you'd buy their album or, um, you know, things were being shared on, you know, platforms like Napster and Morpheus and whatever. Um, there was just like a lot of different ways to get music, um, or for artists to reach out to people. Increasingly, we have an internet where there's basically five websites. There's YouTube, there's, you know, Spotify, there's Apple Music, there's, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and, you know, and Twitter. Um, and obviously there's a few more than that, but, um, you know, there's a tiny handful of companies that have such an outsized control over human attention and your ability to reach people and build an audience and allow people to pay you for what you're doing. Um, and so I think that centralization is often at the root of harms that we ascribe to lack of enforcement or piracy, um, mm. et cetera. Um, the problem is that 
there's a small handful of corporations that, um, you know, basically, um, are the only ones where you can reach people. And for the most part, those companies have not geared themselves toward, um, artists, especially not independent artists, um, or benefiting independent artists. That said, I think the flip side of this, and this goes back to something Leo was saying about just kind of the new versus the old. Um, there's also just, you know, this entire generation of new types of artists and creators who are, Twitch streamers who are talking about video games while they play them, um, who are, uh, you know, online content creators that are making reaction videos of popular movies. Um, and all of that requires, um, reusing, recycling, um, resharing existing art, um, to create new art. And our current copyright system is heavily weighted, as Leah said, toward mm -hmm. protecting the rights of musicians that have been dead for a hundred years over the rights of 17 year olds who are making the next generation of art by reusing, recycling, recreating art that's perhaps already existed. Um, and so we see that, for example, you know, where Twitch streamers get their stream taken down because a song was playing in the background. Um, I've had this happen to me where, you know, I worked with an animator to make a music video of one of my songs. And when we uploaded it, I got a copyright takedown because, uh, you know, we hadn't got, I, I forgot to like get my label to go clear it. Right. And I've had, I've heard this happening mm -hmm. to lots of other artists where, you know, just the copyright system does not keep up with the speed at which most kind of, you know, young artists who use the internet are operating at. Um, and stuff like that can have a real negative impact on kind of this, this upcoming generation of artists. But I think the good thing about that is that, um, views on copyright are shifting dramatically, right? When I have conversations with other artists my age or younger who, even those who are making a full-time living as a touring band or selling records, um, they have very different perspectives on copyright than, you know, the folks that I talked to when I was a member of the American Federation of Musicians or the folks that send me, you know, BMI newsletters every month um, that are, you know, trying to convince me that, you know, the worst thing in the world is music piracy and people downloading my music for free. Um, when I, in fact, know that actually I probably make more money um, because of those people who are downloading my music for free and sharing it because people then do come back and buy an album or buy a T-shirt or just send a donation and be like, hey, love all your music, downloaded it for free, here's 50 bucks. Um, and I think just recognizing that um, the way that people consume culture is changing and the way that people can create culture is changing. And rather than trying to cling to these outdated models and this um, concept of false scarcity, we need to just sort of embrace the beauty of a future where all human works of creativity could be accessible to all people. Um, and where, uh, and where people who create things can still be fairly compensated. That's the world we should be fighting for. Forget clinging to the past. Like, let's try to build that future, um, where we can have this universal library of human knowledge and creativity, um, that the internet could be if we are willing to fight for it and try to shape policies that lead us in that direction. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that that world can exist. And I think it's within our, our lifetimes, you know, that my kid could grow up in that world, um, where they have that access to human knowledge and creativity at their fingertips. Um, but if we head in the direction that we're going now, these surveillance capitalist locked down walled garden monopolies, um, that doesn't look like that future. That looks like a very different future where culture is driven by algorithms rather than by humans and what we, and connecting with each other. Um, and so I think, again, that's why we as Fight for the Future um, are fighting, you know, to change copyright, but also fighting to address things like monopoly power and centralization. Um, and that's also why we care about things like cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology and other decentralized tech projects. Um, you know, while not perfect, some of those technologies have the potential to create something like a Spotify without Spotify, um, where any artist could easily mm -hmm. enable their music to be streamed and enable a microtransaction so they get paid every time someone streams it. Um, you know, those types of things are really mm -hmm. exciting. Um, you know, we're, we still have a lot of work to do to get to the point where, um, they are widely adopted or accessible to most people. Um, but I, we shouldn't, uh, ignore the potential for that or accept that. Um, we just have to live with something like Spotify forever and just push them to do better. That's, I was going to ask you what kind of alternatives might be there that would help artists that aren't monopolies. So, so that would be a starting point then clearly in your mind and, um, any other, um, because you're, you're making a very bold, very passionate call for the dissolution of a, of a, um, of the copyright 
um, system, which in the U.S., but also is quite similar. You know, we see what happens in the U.S. gets adopted across the world, sometimes in with even less flexibil- flexibility, even though we would say there isn't a great amount in the U.S. system, but even... Um, there's even uh, fewer options on fair use, for example, in Europe compared to the U.S., where you have some guaranteed protections, even though they, as you say, seem to get interpreted in narrower and narrower ways. Um, I wonder what kind of support has the campaign drawn and from where? And and maybe as a, a final point, what can individuals, each of us, do to help accelerate this change that you're calling for? Let's see. Oh my gosh, there's so much. I mean, the, I, the, the biggest thing that I would say is that this campaign is just starting for us. We've collaborated previously with uh, with other, with artists in the space to do things like call out the RIAA and other lobbying organizations for um, saying that create that, that sharing the COVID vaccine and other life-saving technology will harm creators and lobbying against sharing uh, intellectual property that will literally save millions of lives. Uh, we've worked with uh, the uh, Union of Musicians and Allied Workers for their justice at, at Spotify campaign, demanding at least one cent per stream. Uh, and that that sort of like led us to this point where we are putting a flag in the sand and saying, this is a, this is, this is a monopoly. Um, it is hurting all creatives, no matter what your medium is, it, from visual, visual art, authors, uh, musicians, streamers, and beyond both new and old mediums, this is fundamentally suppressing our ability to do what we do uh, and to live comfortably doing it, which really, you know, should be our right and is what our fans and supporters intend when they engage with our content on this platform, that they, they think that they're supporting creators, but what they're really doing is feeding a monopoly. And so we've essentially put a flag in the sand here. And a base and, and made a basis for conversation for every time, you know, the next cop uses a Taylor Swift song to try to silence a protester <laughs> or, 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 so or, or whatever to point to this and say and to name that as a, as an ill effect of this concentration of power that should have never happened in the first place. Uh, and then moving forward, we are going to be making this. Uh, this new way of thinking more concrete with 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 a list of demands and with shopping it around to different communities of of like this is what we need to do to start changing this and these are some some grounded concrete changes to to show artists what an alternative might be and to work with artists towards what they envision these alternatives uh, to be so uh, the first call to action that I can I can invite everyone to regardless of if you're a creator or if you just think that this is really messed up is to go to increativemonopolies.com and just sign up and if you're a creator check the little box that says you're a creator and we'll be reaching out as we uh, continue to develop our platform on this and to look to talk to different constituencies and communities about uh, what sort of changes they're excited about and hoping to see and making sure that we're we're pointing toward a future where uh, where this does actually fundamentally change and and Evans Evans kid gets to gets to grow up with the same access to all the art knowledge in the world as a child in Cambodia as a child in Africa as a child in you know in Russia etc the the goal here I think is to largely unwind this myth that we need to lock our creations away and that they're only for a select group of people who can afford them and uh and and to to reprogram our brains uh into not reacting to our artificial scarcity with with eagerness but rather naming it as a harm for the world and also a harm to ourselves when we have to have middlemen enforcing that scarcity and uh, taking away the mass, vast majority of wealth that's generated based upon that premise. Okay, and Evan, I would give a final word to you on the same question. Um, 
and what what can each of us do and what are you hoping for with the campaign ahead yeah for sure i mean the first thing i would say is you know get involved check out fightforthefuture.org sign up for our mailing list follow us on social media um you know this is not a fight that we're going to win overnight cuz like leah said this is you know there's there may be policy skirmishes that come up we're likely to see an attempt to rewrite the DMCA in the next couple of years that if we don't fight for it, it's just going to make it worse. Um, so, you know, be, you know, being vigilant and getting in touch with the organizations that are fighting um, for a future with a copyright system and uh, that works for people, I think, um, is, is crucial. And the last thing I'd say on, on what Leah said is, is this is a culture of war, right? This is about um, reshaping the way we think about these things. And I would say, I think it's important, you know, we're seeing the concept of abolitionist thinking um, start to become more mainstream when we talk about things like policing in our communities, for example. And we've seen the movement calling to defund the police growing um, and gaining a lot of popular support. And I think that it's important that people recognize that like copyright is a form of policing. Um, copyright is about enforcement. It's about censorship. It's about having punitive measures when people share things. Um, and if, you know, you're someone who believes that we should be defunding police, that believes that we need to find alternative methods for dealing with things like quality of life crime within our communities, then you should be expanding your thinking about things like copyright as well and recognizing that having punitive measures like censorship or surveillance um, to catch copyright violators um, is just another form of uh, overreach um, from both corporations and governments. And uh, we need to get smart and think about alternative ways to ensure that people who create things are fairly compensated for their labor um, and that everyone has access to those things, not just those who can afford them, like Leah said. Uh, well, thank you so much, Evan Greer and Leah Holland, both from Fight for the Future. That's fightforthefuture.org and ncreativemonopolies.org if you want to find out more. Thanks for joining me today on Wald Culture. And to our listeners for now, it's goodbye from me, Carla Nellington, and the Wald Culture podcast. And we hope you'll join us for future episodes ahead as we explore the spaces where technology, culture, and copyright collide. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye.